So, welcome everyone. Please come in, have a seat, make yourself comfortable to this seminar on uh, in defense of global norms and values. This seminar is part of a UN Talks series that we at the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation uh, has together with uh, UNDP Sweden office. We're very happy to have you here today and we will try to in a way, continue part of the discussion that you just heard on, on challenges to the, the multilateral system, uh, the number of uh, global challenges, including climate change, displacements, inequalities, shrinking democratic and, and civic space around the world. Um, we're very happy to have a experienced high-level panel here to, to share their views on the challenges, but also possible solutions to this. My name is Per Nordlund. Uh, I have recently joined the Dog Hammarskjöld Foundation as program director, um, but I've been in this field for over 20 years, mostly working at CEDA, but being off on other missions as well. Uh, then we have Ulrika Moder. Uh, doesn't need any introduction in this tent. Uh, Assistant Secretary General and Assistant Administrator of UNDP. We have Mons Molander from Human Rights Watch and the Director of the Sweden and Denmark offices. Then we have Henrik Nordentoft, uh, Director of UNHCR's Northern European office and Ann Paulsen, Head of UN World Food Program Nordic office. So you understand we have a, a, a wide range of experience here on stage and we will try to discuss this first in terms of challenges to the multilateral system from humanitarian peace and development nexus. Uh, so we will actually start with our UN colleagues and then we will invite Mons to comment on what you have heard and also share your own reflections on challenges to the UN system. And then we'll revise and try to approach this from the, the uh, constructive angle of what can we do, what can be achieved. And we'll try to be very practical and get down to who should actually do uh, various things. But we're taking the challenge of the multilateral system as a given. Um, and you have a bit of that in the seminar description. Uh, and I will only use two quotes to share with you how serious the situation is seen. The first is by the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Prince Said, who at the Anna Lind lecture last year said the following, human rights face a stress test today and the pressure is upon us. We face a bare-knuckled, multi-directional brawl about the legitimacy and necessity of rights. That's pretty frank. And Michel Bachelet, the, the uh, existing um, human rights commissioner uh, said the following at a public lecture very recently here in Sweden. If the UN General Assembly had to vote today on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it would not pass. So that is the situation. That is the uh, seriousness of what we have. At the same time, we have opportunities. We have shifting alliances and power dynamics in the, in the system. And we have, of course, Agenda 2030, and other uh, big agreements over the last three, four years that actually provides a lot of, of, of um, platforms for moving forward on these issues. But let us first start then with from inside the UN system. Uh, Ulrika first, with a broader peace development mandate. How do you see these challenges in your everyday work? started with a quite depressive uh, note, uh, I would like perhaps to add that maybe we wouldn't have the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals either if we were to vote in 2019. But we do have them and it is also important to see that there are certainly references to rights within these two agreements. And I think uh, that uh, the Secretary General has stated very clearly that we are up against very strong forces. We know that we see increasing both nationalism and populism and protectionism and thus also a questioning of the rules-based world order, not only the UN but other entities as well. 
And in order to prove the relevance of this in times when we know that these global challenges can only be addressed in cooperation, uh, as they express themselves also at national and local level, uh, I believe that uh, we really need to find a way to s show that both human rights, uh, the uh, normative work with regard to peace and security, uh, but also with regard to sustainable development and, of course, then also climate change is actually something that can help countries to develop and become stronger as nations in these times of, of nationalism. But of course, we all see, and I don't need to say that here, that many of the parts of the UN, such as the Security Council, that are supposed to safeguard these values, uh, don't have the way of working that makes them uh, take this responsibility. You said that we were to move in to the more action-oriented part more later on, yes. but we can then see that the funds and programs also represented here can actually do quite a lot within the mandates given also by the member states in relation to these challenges. And I think that's the best proof that um, the... Uh, multilateral system can deliver and make people believe that multilateral cooperation actually makes change happen. But you also said that the Paris Agreement and the, the Agenda 2030, if we had to vote on them again today, they would probably not pass either. So what has shifted? Why were we able to do this some three, four, five years ago and have a process around it? And are things worse now, still, even though they are in place? Uh, well, I mean, I, I can't tell. Maybe it's, it would be possible. But what happened, I think, uh, which is interesting also in these times, is that the UN had a very fact and science-based discussion uh, leading up to both the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Now, we know also that fake news travel sometimes faster than facts in the world of today, and I think that that is also one of the concerns that we have also within the system, that uh, it's not possible sometimes to have that fact-based discussion any longer and, and uh, that is also a very important part of, of what we need to work with as a UN system. Okay, thank you very much. Henrik, moving on, from your perspective. Yeah, first thank you very much to the Dakar Mosul Foundation for raising this topic, which I think indeed is in time and for the, the people who decided to come to this tent rather than hundreds of other tents ongoing at the same time. From uh, the United Nations Refugee Agency, the whole aspect of global norms and values and international law is absolutely crucial because it's a fabric around which the protection of refugees hinges and therefore international collaboration is absolutely essential. The norms we talk about are relying on two pillars. On the one hand, an international agreement that 146 countries have signed on to out of 195 in the world to protect the rights of refugees, to make sure that they are received in safe territory. And on the other, the creation of an agency, the creation of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, appointed directly by the General Assembly. So these are the two pillars. And in a way, you should think then that the system works. And what we are looking at here is what are then the violations that can happen and have we seen a change in violations and how they're being dealt with over the years. So violations could be not to protect refugees, not to let them access when they want to cross into other territories, to block them. And I think we've seen a number of situations, and you know them as well, uh, in the Burm area in the, in the Syria, there were 60,000 people there, many countries are nervous about letting in large numbers of refugees. There's also many countries who are letting in refugees, but nevertheless, there are various situations. We also see violations where countries demand the extradition of people who may be their political opponents. And depending on the power structures of the different countries, achieve that. So there's a number of different violations uh, happening. Another way we see the the change in norms and values, and it's a little bit reflecting, I think, what the previous two High Commissioners for Human Rights were saying is that indeed, when we look back at the resolutions we adopted in the 80s and in the early 90s, but let's say in the 80s, they were all directed from Europe towards Africa basically suggesting ways of behavior, values, reinforcing it in Africa and other places. And in a way, the refugee syndrome was not as prominent towards ourselves. Now, over the years, in the beginning of 90s, we suddenly saw a change where suddenly it was no longer possible to create the same kind of strong messaging that in a way was to send to others because it's a universal problem. And in a way, we were talking about these norms applies to everyone. And countries then became reluctant to set the bar very high. 
And recently, again, on the question on, I think, the other threat we have seen uh, is when people in different countries I've talked to will go to the very bottom of our international obligation, will go to the border of the international obligations. This was never the intention between the creation of international law and the rule system. Basically, every country was expected to say this was a minimum, but depending on your abilities, your resources, your national structures, you would be able to position yourself at different levels in your national implementation. So it only developed a, a lower threshold. But there we have seen, in a number of situations, the pressure down. And we have seen, and I think this is another threat, and I think we see it, I was looking at the 146 countries which have signed on. 80% of those who signed on to the instrument signed on in the 50s and in the 60s. And therefore, there is a more of a messaging today also that says all these instruments in the old days, the human rights instruments, are, need to be revised or need to be rediscussed because they are not timely or they are not relevant for our times. And of course, it is here we discuss a lot about saying, no, they are still timely, they are still universal. The values they represent needs, of course, to be looked at contextualized, but we are not into a situation where we need to reopen all that discussion one more time. So again, these are the pressures in a way I think in the system. I'll stop there uh, because of course there's also many positive aspects of what we can do, we can look at later. I just a follow up on that then. If we look at the ICC, the International Criminal Court and the challenges to that, how does that relate to your work? How do you see, are that reflecting the same sort of 80s, 90s, I'm not a specialist on international criminal court, uh, so um, you can say that, of course, refugees are caused by violations of human rights that forces police, peace, people to flee. Oh. And you can say that in many situations we fail to hold those responsible for these mass disasters and mass crises causing displacement to justice and in a way responsible for what they have done. So if, you, if that's what your question is aiming yeah. at... Um, uh, uh, but uh, whether that has changed over the last 10, 15 years, I think maybe you have a better position to mm -hmm. answer afterwards. I'll, okay. I'll pass All the right. question on to you. We'll right wait for much. months. All right. I think so. And please, let us hear from your perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation. Um, I think it's on a very depressing note as well um, to use the words that you used in the beginning that was uh, those of Prince Said. I mean, the system, the humanitarian system is really be being stressed, test. Uh, these years. I'd like to just provide a little background um, for the type of context that we as the World Food Programme are operating in. Um, we are in more than 80 countries, some of the most complex countries in the world. Uh, hunger is increasing for the third year consecutive. The numbers are going up, which is really alarming because we are, of course, aiming for zero hunger by 2030. Um, conflicts are really the main driver, climate change as well, but conflict. And over 60% of the hungry people um, live in, in countries that are marred by, by war conflict. Um, we spend 80% of our budget in, in, in countries at war and conflict. So at the same time as, as, as conflicts are, are increasing and being more and more protracted, at the same time we also see that commitment in parts of the world at least commitment and respect for humanitarian principles and values are really shrinking um, and this is of course really worrying because this is the whole sort of uh, this is what we have uh, to make sure that we can do the work that we are uh, we are mandated to do out there to reach the most vulnerable people reach them at all times completely independent on any political agendas, it should never be a political question which child gets to eat over, an, <clears throat> over another child. Um, so we need, of course, to defend those uh, principles uh, that are enshrined in the UN Charter and, and elsewhere. Um, I would like to mention a couple of examples of how our work is being compromised. Um, due to, to the pressure on, on the humanitarian pin, pr principle and international humanitarian law. Um, we work in South Sudan, uh, one of the major operations that we are involved in as the World Food Programme, um, to secure humanitarian access in South Sudan is really a, 
a devilish puzzle in a way. It's, it's, it's totally complicated. And uh, last year in 2018, we had more than uh, 760 reported attacks or incidents against humanitarian um, personnel and assets. Um, 15 aid workers were, humanitarian aid workers were uh, killed while delivering assistance. Um, and this is, of course, something that is, is extremely worrying and it's also um, hampering with, the, with our possibilities to, um, to continue to help those uh, who need our help most. You might have heard also in Yemen that we are facing enormous challenges these, uh, these, at these days. Um, they are part of uh, the country where we are not um, we are not allowed sufficient access to both assess the situation to evaluate to assess who is the most hungry and who needs our help the most. We are not um, provided with access to also come in afterwards and monitor that the food aid that we actually provide is is um, is going to the right people, um, and that has led to a very very. Uh, desperate decision and, and very unfortunate decision to suspend par, uh, food in parts of the country. It's, it's, it's a very difficult decision to take and it, um, it's not one that's taken easily or very often. I think it's the first time in my time in the organization where we have decided to suspend food aid in a country. Um, but um, it's, it's, again, it's humanitarian values and principles that are at stake if we allow this to, to go on. So that's a couple of examples of where we see um, the pressure on the system and the pressure the how we're being uh, stress tested. In, in different operations. Interesting, yeah. So, so uh, in this broader discussion of the triple nexus between humanitarian peace and development work, how is that affecting your work? Because this is a continuum, it's not, it's not separate categories, obviously. And at some stage it becomes political, of course. Uh, still the imperative is to save lives. How, how does that work? How, how do you sort of work more integrated in this triple nexus sense? I mean, we, we have a dual mandate in the World Food Programme, and maybe it's not very widely known, because I think when you see us on, on SVT or other sort of main media outlets, we are mostly sort of uh, reported upon during our main emergencies, such as South Sudan or Yemen or, or elsewhere, Syria. Uh, but we actually have a dual mandate. We also have a mandate to changing lives. So we, have, we are saving lives, but we're also changing lives. And we are increasingly aiming and insisting on using humanitarian dollars as development dollars. So we don't really start a humanitarian... We, we do save lives, of course, and in, in the sudden onset of a conflict, uh, there, there is a period of time where, where saving lives is what you need to do. Uh, but as soon as we can, we'll transition our assistance into s assistance that also help build resilience and longer-term development. So it's part of our mandate. The problem is the funding uh, funding structure where we have not been, whereas our humanitarian operations are much better funded, the funding for the development part of our work, portfolio of our work is really lagging behind. But I think with the uh, sustainable development goals, the Agenda 2030, uh, this whole understanding of a more holistic approach and an integrated approach. I was here yesterday with CIPRI, we just launched a study with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute on the correlation between food security and security and how food aid, this complete sort of lack of fundamental uh, basic um, uh, necessities or, or goods can actually cause conflict and how food security then can contribute to, 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 to the prospects for peace. Uh, so far we have looked upon it in four different countries. We talked about Mali yesterday. There's a couple of studies now um, a preliminary report and a four country studies that I will warmly recommend anyone with the interest to 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 look at. Okay, thank you. I mean, part of, of well, the solutions I suspect will end up talking a little bit about the funding of the system and how that funding is provided and, and, and what dif difference that makes. But before we get to that, Mons, now you heard reflections from sort of inside the, the UN system and uh, not the complete range of organizations, but a, a fair share of them. Your take on this? 
Yes, thank you very much. Well, first, I'd like to go back to your initial quote of, of Bachelet, that if we vote on the UN Declaration today, it wouldn't pass. But I think it's important to remember that uh, working with human rights has never been easy. It has always been a very time-consuming and, and uh, an effort. Remember that it took 20 years to transform the UN Declaration into legally binding conventions. It was enormous work, led to a split up in economic, social, cultural rights and civil political rights. Some rights disappeared. The right to property is not in the legally binding conventions, for example. But then we saw a development in the Convention on the Rights of a Child and the last edition with the rights of people with disabilities added in 2006. So this is an area that is constantly developing, but it has never been easy. But of course there are challenges today, and I agree with much that has been said. And I, you can say that there are as many challenges to the multilateral system as people here. Like would, you can see them from different perspectives. I would say three main challenges as we see it. One is the position of the main global powers. The second is the rise of populism. And the third is the uh, response, the inadequate response from the UN system itself. So let me explain a little bit what I mean. The first is, of course, the, when Trump entered into power in 2017, it was very clear from the moment he set his foot in the White House that he had an agenda towards the UN that was very detrimental. It was rumors about a presidential executive order that would cut the funds of the UN just days after he entered office. It never materialized, but the fact that he withdrew funding to what was called the global gag rule, uh, had an enormous impact on uh, financing of um, service provision for sexual reproductive health and rights. And uh, also coming back to something that was mentioned before, the ICC, this beacon of accountability for the worst crimes on human rights that was set up in 2000 after we saw the genocide in, in the former Yugoslavia. It was just set up to deal with war crimes. It, uh, the prosecutor general launched, um, wanted to start investigations into war crimes of Afghanistan. It provoked an enormous reaction from the US side because they feared that they and their allies would under scrutiny. They revoked the visa of Fatou Bensouda, the prosecutor general of ICC, and Bolton, famous for his attacks on, on the United System as, as, uh, as such, launched a very ferocious attack on the ICC. And the problem is that it had some effect, that when the panel of judges in ICC was to decide on whether open investigation, they said no, because there was no progress, in a, and there was no possibility in achieving progress. And this decision that they are abstaining from opening dossiers that would not be fruitful because they know that main players would not be helpful is dangerous for the system in itself. So that is one example about the, um, what we see the Trump administration, how the harm they're doing, but also China. We wrote a report last year about the, the deliberate attacks of China on the United Nations human rights system, how they are working the system with uh, civil servants, uh, with diplomats, but also visiting NGOs uh, to the UN system in order to silence criticism of, of uh, China. And that's changed. China has always been critical, um, even in the 90s and, and 20s, but the last 10 years they have been much more proactive, acting also outside the borders of uh, China to silence criticism. And we see that happening today when there are uh, information about uh, a million uh, people being illegally detained in the Xinjiang province in China, the, uh, mostly Muslim Uyghurs. And the efforts that China is making to rectify this image, or pro progress, uh, uh, project an image of that everything is safe and sound, uh, have exhibitions, invite diplomats to Xinjiang. It's a PR offensive in order just to, to make sure that the criticism is not received. So I think that the role of China and uh, the Trump administration should not be underestimated. But also we see the rise of populism in general. When a person like Philippines, in uh, Duterte in Philippines, becomes elected on a, uh, an agenda that is disregarding the rights of certain groups of people, saying, I will be very violent in oppressing the uh, uh, drug epidemic of the country, becomes elected on that uh, ag agenda and actually uh, delivers on his promises. And, uh, uh, kills without any kind of due process, a number of drug addicts, mostly marginalized uh, men in uh, the poor rural areas. That is applauded, and so that is an agenda that is disregarding the rights and is implemented by uh, a leader that being elected on that agenda. And we see that happening, of course, in many countries in the world.
And it comes often with the scapegoating of minorities, that is, uh, the ones that are most in need of the rights. And the third issue that I think is important to raise is also what we see uh, as a lack of appropriate response from the UN system. And uh, in April this year, our executive director of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth, wrote an op-ed about the silence of Guterres in the face of uh, what we see as obvious uh, human rights violations. And it's, for example, the fact that Guterres is not willing to speak out against the uh, detention of Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Uh, he's not willing to launch investigations into Ka the Khashoggi murder, into the chemical attacks uh, in Syria, or the killing of two UN experts in Congo. Uh, so we see that this strategy of trying to maintain good relations with the main power in order to safeguard the integrity of the UN system is actually undermining the UN system and uh, undermining the credibility also uh, for the UN capacity to deal with atrocities. Great, thank you very much. I mean, some of them, you haven't mentioned Putin, who declared the end of values such as multiculturalism and, and liberalism and so on. So it seems like the advocates for, for the other side of the argument are very strong and very vocal. And of course, they don't, they don't need to consider being constructive about that. But what about the other side? Have, have we, the human rights community, been good enough at communicating the successes and the, the, the uh, incentives in the human rights system for, for people in general? Or have we failed to grow that community and so on? And do we, how do we do that? Is that by being strong in the sense that is being communicated by the leaders you talked about? And, or do we need to have a different approach from the other side, being more constructive, not being, you know, the, the um, Sweden is sometimes, we had that discussion, seen as the one who, who stands up and, and waves the flag and, and but people are sort of stepping back and saying, okay, we heard it. I mean that's not so how do we how do we from the other side engage constructively with that in, you know the where the big powers who are filling some of the space that is out there today uh, are, are are taking or claiming. Uh, I? Yes. Well, I, we face this problem a lot, and I think that one, one thing is to resist any kind of perception as human rights being a left-wing add-on to policy. When Theresa May is saying that we want to prevent these leftist human rights lawyers from doing proper warfare in, in Iraq, it, it's, it's not true. And we need to be very clear that these are legal protection structures, often constitutional protection, uh, protecting everyone. And uh, it doesn't belong in a left-right political scale. So that's one thing to make sure that everyone knows that these are rights for everyone. But I also think that it was a very interesting campaign in the 90s called Touche pas mon pot, Don't Touch My Friend, which uh, was an interesting way in invoking people's engagement for the protection of someone else. And human rights often becomes a problem where you see that it doesn't affect me. It affects someone else. It's the right of the criminal or the immigrant or the drug abuser. I'm not one of them, so I won't take a stand. But to engage people more, to realize that I need to take a stand for the rights of others, because actually those are my rights too. That, that would be needed. Okay, all right. So let's, let's now try to, to turn around the discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go first, Mons, since you had to go last the other mm. time. Uh, and, and try to look at sort of top three or the most critical issues to address that are constructive, where we can move forward on some of these issues. Uh, because clearly we have those as well. And I guess it is an issue of what, what, what part is just rhetorics, what part is just putting different messages out there and how much is actually changing in the multilateral system itself. Because there is sort of an inertia in, in, in these things. It doesn't just change from one position to the other. There are stability in, in, in these institutions. But how far have we come and, and what are the sort of institutional ways of dealing with some of these challenges forward. Do the institutions still matter? Do they work? Well, I mean, I, I could start where I finished the, about the UN system, and I think that is a very important point for us, that the UN system has always found itself in a situation where you need to balance the role as the silent mediator and uh, the, the public voice 
And the problem is that if you become too silent in the face of atrocities, you lose confidence, and the, you risk having a situation where the, uh, the, the victims of human rights abuses feel that the United Nations doesn't care about them. And that might, in effect, uh, undermine um, not only the credibility of the system of the United Nations, but also uh, effective ways of working towards sustainable peace. So I think that is an important uh, part of what we would like to see from the UN system, that more articulated criticism, public criticism, and uh, from the top level, from Guterres himself. But the second is that small countries can play a big role. And we have seen that happening in countries like Liechtenstein, who took a very important, brave initiative, setting up a, a prosecutor for Syria, in a situation where the Security Council was totally blocked, they set up uh, like what is called a triple IM, like a special prosecutor mechanism to investigate the war crimes that happen in Syria. Very brave from a small country. We've seen uh, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands going together to create the She Decides initiative to fill the funding gap created by the Trump global gag rule. We've seen Iceland leading very brave cross-country cross initiative against the Philippines, leading to responsibility of crime and uh, the drug combat being removed moved from the police and moved to social authorities, leading to drop of deaths. And we also see Netherlands taking a very brave stance against Saudi Arabia and creating accountability for, uh, structure for, for Yemen and war crimes in Yemen. So there are some examples of where small countries can play a big difference, but we, we would like to see that more. We'd like to Sweden step forward, for example, heading initiatives on Libya or Egypt, countries where it's very difficult to, to have the international community leading. Thanks. Maybe just before we sort of go on to 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 the other three about your take on on constructive ways forward, the the Mons claim that the UN is perhaps too silent when some of the other more authoritarian leaders are speaking out against the system. Do you agree from inside the system? So I think that this could certainly be the case in certain circumstances. And we were saying also with a very interesting report on Myanmar being discussed the last uh, weeks that it's also very easy to say, perhaps after a time has passed, that we could have done it differently. Now in that report, uh, there is also a discussion about the lack of coordination and different parts of the system acting differently and not in a coordinated way, where some thought that they could perhaps work, and, and this was of course ahead of the Rohingya crisis and the refugee crisis, and maybe I have more comments to that. Uh, so I, I, I do believe it is important. I used to say that we need to see that we can be in the front line of the mandate given to each and every uh, entity within the UN system, and then of course, and that is actually something that the Secretary General has done, uh, see to that we work much more coordinated. Uh, it is it's badly needed in times uh, when we are not only challenged uh, by uh, new uh, and different and values, but also where there is a lack of, of long-term funding for the system. We need to work differently together. Um, so sure. yes, I, I think that the discussion certainly is very important, uh, and I think we can learn from different uh, situations that we have been in and still are in, such as the Rohingya crisis, uh, and uh, and improve certainly. Henrik. Uh, Rohingya crisis has been mentioned. Sure. But I'll take it uh, from a different angle. Because I think what was interesting, once in your examples, all your initiatives, you only mentioned Western European yeah, countries. I was about to say mm -hmm. that as well. This yeah. is not the yeah. future yeah. to defend multilateralism. What we need is India, Brazil, yeah. and Russia, and China to yeah. speak multilateralism and defend the values. We have to remember that a lot of these things, as you said, it took 20 years, but it was in a mm -hmm. different world. It was different political yeah. challenges. Yeah. So... One of the first things that we need to do with violations, obviously, and when you say the UN is silent, well, the UN sometimes also acts, of course, to, and fully relies on the support of countries. And yes, the United States was very strong in the 90s, and this helped UNHCR also with refugee, promoting refugee values. And yes, it's, it's now things have changed, but many other things have changed in the world as well. That suddenly has another connotation to it. What I'm suggesting, or what we are suggesting, is that like a marriage, like democracy, as we see as well, it needs to be nurtured. Multilateralism cannot be taken for granted. And we also have to understand that multilateralism is not about funding the United Nations. Multilateralism is understanding that the nations who have decided to create the world order, these agreements, there is no other upholding mechanism except themselves. And if they decide to let that, in a way, 
uh, tear at the fabric, that is what then happens. Therefore, I was very happy when I saw this morning uh, the German president and the uh, French, um, uh, French declare to the Italians that per prosecuting the, the captain of the Sea Watch 3, who had tried to rescue people at sea and disembark them, is not European values. Also this morning, the strategic agenda for the European Council is out, 1924. Declared objective is, we support multilateralism, we support the UN, these are European values. But we need, of course, then to reaffirm that across. We also need to do something better, I think, which is to work, and on the one hand, we need to reaffirm the validity of all the values and norms we're talking about. And we do that in international conferences, in meetings. Every year, thanks to Sweden and others, there are discussions which reaffirms in a way the persistent value of the certain behaviors. So it's not like we just leave the convention from 51. There are different ways of doing it. And as may, some of you may know, uh, there was a global compact on refugees signed last year. It was based on a declaration from the General Assembly with 196 countries. All these things are things to nurture the system and reaffirming it. It's not renegotiating it, but reaffirming it. Okay, Henrik, Secondly, I'll, I'll come back to that. Sure. Uh, we, we'll do the round. Anne, okay. and do you just have a comment? I mean, you're less political in a sense, your mandate. Do you have a comment on okay. this discussion, whether the UN speaks out or...? or no, I don't really. I would much rather talk about the instruments yes. that we have, <laughs> okay, uh, if you that. don't mind. So, we, uh, so we'll, we'll start in that and we'll go okay. and, and Henrik and then we'll so finish okay. off with Ulrika from your own perspectives on that. But take this question about, the, because you mentioned the small countries and how I, I agree about the alliances that needs to be built with the big countries, but also, of course, with the small countries. And the small countries were the ones who stood up and defended Dag Hammarskjöld in the General Assembly against the big powers. So th there is a, an important uh, of small countries in the UN system, obviously. Yeah, and I think a very fine example of that of small countries making a big impact is actually Security Council Resolution 2417, which was adopted last year and which was pushed forward by Sweden and the Netherlands, but also Kuwait and, and, and Ivory Coast. So a bit of coalition all across the world and not just Western countries. And, and it's a very powerful tool for organizations like WFP, World Food Programme. It is an instrument that if leveraged um, appropriately, it will, it, will, it will be a very strong weapon against using food and food and starvation as a weapon of war. Um, it, it, we, it was adopted last year in, in May and the first report has already been, been provided for the, um, for the Security Council on the situation in six different countries, including Syria and Yemen and the, and the obvious breaches on, uh, on, on international humanitarian principles. So I think with uh, Security Council Resolution 2417, there is a very powerful to, new tool to 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 really reinforce the humanitarian principles and 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 to res the respect of humanitarian uh, rules. Um, I think also it's worth mentioning the great bargain and the funding modalities. I don't know if it's going to a bit too far out of topic, but I think the whole way that the system is is being funded is really really important. And again, I think mentioning small countries, the Nordic countries are really proponent of good humanitarian donorship. Um, there was a. Uh, the ambition of the Great Bargain was that by 2020, which is next year, all contributions would be uh, flexible up to 30%. For our organization, um, we're at 6.2%. Only 6.2% of our funding is actually flexible. Sweden is our top um, top donor of flexible fund funds and have been so for the last uh, more than 10 years. And I think that's an important discussion as well and where we have new instruments through the yeah. Great Bargain yeah. to hopefully put pressure on the situation to also help us being able to work in a different way and better bridge the humanitarian development peace nexus. Thanks. Yeah, it's not only an issue of what we do uh, or how much we, we supply into the system. It's very much how we do it, what is the form for that. And I think the core funding, which has proven, of course, in development cooperation to be an effective way of strengthening not least civil society organizations, so they can act and work in a more political environment and, and, and be adaptive to, to those challenges. Henrik. Now, yeah, 
just to add maybe one or two more on building on what Mons was saying, I think working with countries around the world is indeed the way forward. And I think uh, when you look at the 146 countries that have signed the convention, many of the big countries in the Middle East who are housing the large number of refugees have not signed the refugee convention, but still does it out of their own values and their own value set. So there is different value sets in the world. And therefore, we're also sometimes working with faith-based organizations and looking at the Quran. What does the Quran say? How does the Quran support asylum? And when there is a crisis, and I think that's also, again, silent diplomacy, you don't always run to the biggest power. You run to the country that may have the biggest influence in that situation. And you work with that country to try to say, can you help in addressing the situation and how it evolves? And then the question as, as well is, we need to make sure we educate the next generation of the value. And this is, as you said, to counter populism. Populism is really riding over us in social media. I think we are all swamped and overwhelmed. And helping everyone understand the fakes from the right, from the fake news, from the right news. Uh, we need to do a lot of work with the young generation to reinforce multilateralism, the value, shows what is happens. And secondly, we ourselves need to be, and I think that is where I would agree with you, we need to be very efficient in communicating the results. This is where funding then comes in, where we should be able to say that things are not in a crisis, we are not able to, we are able to deal with it if we are given the, the, the right tools and the right support. So these are sort of the, the, the two, three concrete things I will say we can do still. A lot of education, a lot of talking, a lot of reaffirmation of the fabric of multilateralism. All right. So reclaim that space continuously, right? Absolutely. That uh, you can't rest on the conventions and you have to Absolutely. bring them to life continuously. Ulrika, final I, words. I also wanted to say something with regard to the funding compact because it's really an irony that uh, there are expectations on the UN that we are actually not able to meet because of the lack of long-term funding. I mean, we could be much more strategic and also act much quicker and improve our coordination if we were given the same conditions as the World Bank or the different vertical funds or the EU uh, Commission for that matter. Now, I, I also, because I also reacted to the examples, and maybe you have more examples, uh, mm -hmm. but of course we need to see too that these values that we talk about, even though defined from different angles, are actually there and decided upon within the family of the UN. And while I do believe that the Nordic countries are very important, we can also see, and especially also with the invitation that we have uh, with the Global Goals and the Paris Agreement, where we also have invited different actors from societies to be very active uh, in the implementation of the agreements, that we can find also these uh, values uh, relating also to human rights. And uh, within the board of UNDP, I'm always very happy when I see that uh, perhaps some of the Nordics started discussion on the importance of democratic governance, rule of law and human rights. And the discussion is being picked up by an African country. Because if we can break also the dynamic, as we know, it always plays out. But there are also examples where we have needed to break it. And the Paris Agreement with the African group was such an example. So we really need to build uh, different coalitions within the UN and also see to that there are both countries and actors within countries that uh, can be of support doing this. And this is also very interesting with the UN, as we know that there is one country and one vote. And uh, I mean, the small island states, uh, the Pacifics and other parts of the small island states, they have, of course, now a uh, very important role with regard to climate change and, and uh, how they can also play uh, with their cards in this uh, being very small countries, but still very affected by the situation. Thank you very much. I'm, I was very happy to be part of that initiative or the, together with you and, and the colleagues on the UNDP strategic framework and the issues around democratic governance, rule of law, peace and conflict issues. Uh, and it shows that although we are a sort of trusted friend of the UN system, we need to have that critical role, not just to the crit critics out there, but also to the UN system. And this time it paid off. Uh, I think that was, uh, I'm happy that was a, a good example. Okay, thank you very much. I think there is no chance of summarizing this. We're coming to the end. Uh, I think part of this is, of course, to be standing firm on the principles of the human rights system, the multilateral system, the conventions and so on, but being also realistic and flexible and practical about how to implement that and how to get traction for that in the system or to regain that traction. And that has to be a messy process. When, when we push through the, the convention uh, on, on uh, rights offline and online, uh, in 2016, I think, 15, 16, Turkey and Brazil were 
supporting Sweden in this process. At the same time, Turkey was shutting down social media uh, and, and Brazil was an opponent of Goal 16. So it's going to be messy when we engage in that, in that discussion, but I think it's a, it's a critical one. At the foundation, we have been in a listening and learning mode. This was tremendously uh, exciting for us. This is a big part of our mandate. We look forward to taking this forward based on what you have been talking. We haven't talked so much about the other side of values and norms. Is uh, of course, the sort of integrity of leadership within the UN on some of these issues. But fortunately, we have a session at 4 o'clock where we will go deeper into the issues around norms, leadership, integrity, and the, the importance of that. Uh, so it's a how question, not just a what question. Um, so we welcome all of you back for that. And uh, with that, we, we, um, we end on a positive note, cautiously positive, but um, we will continue the struggle and reclaim that space. Thank you all. <laughs>